Okay, so how many of you saw the series finale of Game of Thrones on Sunday? You can sort of see. Okay, hands down. How many of you thoroughly enjoyed it? Like this was the best series finale ever. A lot less hands. So I prepared this theme before I saw the finale. I'm not sure that I would have picked it uh, if I had seen it first. But let's say these two things. One, if you haven't seen it, don't plan to see it, don't worry. You can still hopefully enjoy the talk, appreciate and understand it. And if you did spend about 80 hours of your life over the last eight years, well then this can be a little bit of group therapy, okay? So I'm Jonathan Barrent. I'm a director at X, which is the moonshot factory of Alphabet, i.e. Google, and I focus on wearables. And today I'm gonna to distill down about 15 years of testing consumer wearables and share some findings uh, and also talk about where I think uh, the direction of the space is going. If you go to the next slide, I guess I can do that. Let's see if that works. Great. So given the short amount of time, I'm really just gonna cover the two topics to make it a little bit enjoyable and hopefully memorable. I will connect it to the kings and queens of Westeros, which is Game of Thrones, and do that in the sense of the challenges. What are the, the, those that are challenged to really be a dominant player in the space of sleep wearables for consumers? And then we'll prognosticate a bit and say who might actually come up on top. So, without further ado, King Tommen. So, King Tommen, all you need to know, he was young, and he was a little bit early to rise to the throne, and so was Zio. Anyone have a Zio uh, from 2004? A few hands there. It was actually a, quite a, a cool device. And in fact, there's things about it that I miss today in today's wearables. Uh, essentially, you put a band on your head, for EEG, which is uh, great that they were using that as a measure. Another thing that I really liked about it was it had a great form factor. You don't see it really right now in consumer wearables because everything's trying to be miniaturized, but it, you know, it, it, you're used to having an alarm clock, and so you just had to take it out, put it there, and you would instantly get that gratification of seeing what was your hypnogram and a, and a sleep score. Uh, so that was, that was kind of nice. Now, I think they were before their time, a good eight years before really the wearable uh, revolution took off with the uh, fuel band and Fitbit and things like that. And unfortunately, while they did a lot of things right, I think they anchored the market for over a decade on a fairly meaningless score, which is the sleep score. No thank you for that. Next up, King Joffrey. All you need to know about him, he was cruel to the bone and unfortunately, the basis watch, lots of promise, actually fairly robust in clinical validation, 92 to 93% correlation with PSG, the gold standard in sleep. However, it started to burn people. So not good for a sleep watch, <laughs> not good for any watch at all. And that was a real disappointment. I had probably half a dozen of these and was having various people uh, track it. And so that was a disappointment. Now we come to King Robert. So Robert Baratheon, great soldier, excellent fighter in the field, didn't want to be king, wasn't really fit to be a king, and neither was Fitbit. So Fitbit, great for tracking, not so good for tracking steps, not that good for sleep. 2015, there was a lawsuit filed that it was over tracking sleep by about 60 minutes. And this is a real challenge Today, This is probably the primary challenge of the many devices that are out there. Uh, I, I did a, uh, just an observational study myself uh, last week to test some of the uh, state of the art. And the best machine that actually a consumer can get their hands on that does uh, sort of clinical grade EEG is the Z machine. And it comes at a cool $3,500. So it's not really a consumer device. It's really meant for something just leading up to a sleep study. But I use that to verify the Apple Watch Auto Sleep, which is a nice feature, uh, or it's a nice app on the Apple Watch because it just automatically knows when you're sleeping and records it. And against the Aura Ring. So an interesting form factor is just a ring. And it's just like this and, and has um, uh, PPG sensors to measure primarily the heart rate. So, uh, and you can see there over just you know, three nights, again, very observational, not drawing conclusions, but there was a lot of variance in uh, both the total sleep time and then especially the deep sleep and the REM sleep. 
Now, a couple nights did actually correlate fairly well with the Aura ring, and I have a pretty tight fit. In fact, I can't really take the ring off that easily, so maybe that helped. I did look at the literature review and some of the studies on the Aura ring show that it actually didn't have that high of correlation with deep sleep and uh, REM sleep, uh, only like 50%. My hypothesis on that is, again, the challenge is the fit. You know, if you have a nice snug fit, you're probably going to get a more accurate reading. So accuracy, a huge challenge for the market right now. King John, fan favorite and uh, hopeful. I won't, somebody in the uh, green room said they hadn't seen the final, so there would be no spoilers here. But uh, lots of people think he'd be a, a good king. And the trouble with John is he's not comfortable with being a king. And unfortunately, some of our best options uh, really aren't that comfortable. But let me talk about some of the positive sides. So you've got the Rhythm Dream, and you have the Philip Smart Sleep, and then you have the Sleep Shepherd. Uh, the good news is they are using uh, part of the gold standard, EEG. Now, you need to add a few other things like EMG, muscle tone, but they're still they're doing those things right. Um, it's just that when you try this, um, has anybody tried one of these? I would be surprised. I can't see the hands very well. Maybe a couple in front, yeah. Um, it, it is a little bit tough to have something that bulky on your head. Now, Rhythm Dream is coming up with a new version. Uh, I expect that to be trimmed down a little bit, but that is the, uh, the primary challenge. I've passed these out to numerous friends and family members who really have trouble with sleep, and this has the promise of helping with insomnia, you know, staying asleep and falling asleep, and I think the main challenge is it feeling comfortable on the head. So, we, no lineup of would-be kings and queens of Westeros would be complete without Queen Daenerys. And, uh, however, the cost is very high, and she pays a high cost, let's just say that, uh, so we won't spoil anything. Um, but I looked at the average price, and I didn't even, of course, include the Z machine at 3500 but these are just some of the top uh, trackers out there, and it's expensive. I think this is, is, is an expensive list, and especially if you look at the ones that are gonna most likely provide the most value, you're in the $400 range. Uh, and so I think this is a huge challenge and a barrier. You also have high expectations when you pay for this much. So who's gonna rule? Well, it's no surprise, I'm not gonna crown any of those, but I will talk about four rules of law. Like, what do I think somebody that is gonna do very well in the next two to three years, what will be true about them? Oh, this is, I think, a earlier version, but there's actually four rules. We'll see if, if there's a magical fifth. Uh, first, most important, remember we sleep in order to be fully awake. We do this, we, we have these nights of sleep and we wanna feel rested and most present during the day. And I think that's where this idea of a sleep score at night is less relevant. What we really need is a daytime score. And if you think about the, uh, how we are using our smartphones uh, on average about 50, 60 times uh, a day, some a lot more than that, and about 200 minutes, fortunately we have a lot of data to actually derive some interesting statistics from it. There are people at MIT that have done this for mood and arousal. Uh, I talked to Jamie Zeitzer from Stanford and he did some work with Bing and Nike Fuel and he saw a correlation between query response time on Bing uh, and fatigue and, and sleepiness. So I think this is, this is an interesting change that I think we will see. You're starting to see the beginnings of this with like the Aura Ring, it'll talk about a readiness score um, for that day, but I think that going a step further we need is an actual daytime score based on your smartphone usage and that will be uh, key for the next set of sleep wearables. Comfortable form factor for clinically validated measurements. So we need sleep-friendly EEG. I think that is uh, very important. Um, without, without the EEG, I don't think we're gonna get the correlation we want. Uh, you know, there's been lots of, lots of work, lots of algorithms, uh, machine learning thrown at these data sets, but I do think unless you had a calibration phase, perhaps if you had a calibration phase, then some of these uh, non-EEG metrics would work, but I think they'd have to be calibrated on an individual level. So I believe it's gonna have to be sleep-friendly EEG for it to be effective. I didn't give the Rhythm Dream and the Philips Smart Sleep its due. It actually enhances sleep, not just tracks it. 
What do I mean by that? So there were some studies done, uh, replicated in several different labs, where if you stimulate with pink noise at obviously a low enough volume during deep sleep, you can increase the amplitude of the slow wave. And they actually show some effectiveness of that, not just on the EEG measurement, but in memory tests the, the day after. And these are double-blind controlled studies. So it's, it's very interesting to think about uh, sleep enhancement as uh, a place that I think people will be going towards. And here's perhaps the uh, uh, most controversial one that I'll throw out there today, is I think all this really should be free. This should be a basic right. If something is clinically validated, who would have an interest in making sure that you're sleeping well? Car insurance. We have great data on fatigue and sleepiness, sleep deprivation and accidents. And then there's all kinds of uh, health-related concerns uh, due to poor sleep. So I think that somebody, uh, you know, a company or a uh, startup that pursues that with that end in mind, hopefully can get the funding they need in order to do the hard work of the clinical study. So in summary, there is no king and queen of sleep wearables yet. I think machine learning will be applied to daytime and nighttime scores for there really to be a closed loop system. And then finally, sleep tech should be free for all. Thank you very much.